Hello, my name is Carol May Whittick. Welcome to Her Conversations, Tools for the Awakening. Her is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. This is the optimal state to embody in order to attract our highest desires. What is the awakening? This is the moment in time when humanity rises up out of the darkness. Who is awakening? Each one of us present on earth today, reclaiming our sovereignty, seeking greater possibilities in our reality and looking for solutions. We know being awakened is not a lofty ideal, but a necessity. If we can transform ourselves, we can change the world. Guests on her conversations will speak to your spirituality, sensuality and soul. Listen to their stories and hear how they are in service to the world. Let their words and these conversations embolden and inspire you. Let me take a moment to speak about the new course on higher energetic resonance, Your Awakened Voice. This is a self-led course for you to release the power of your voice. Now you might want to launch a podcast, speak in public or confidently express yourself in your daily life and you still feel stuck in your stories or have fears about your voice. This course, I've created this course to support you to clear any energetic blockages, release your disempowering fears and unlock the hidden potential of your voice. Now more than ever, the world needs people in their true voice. More details about this in the show notes and also to remind you that Her Conversations has a sister podcast, Higher Energetic Resonance Inspirations. All the information and link to that are in the show notes as well. My guest this week is Claire Doré, a mindset and embodiment coach, a motivational keynote speaker, podcast host and writer. She also features weekly on Dublin City FM on Friday's Good Morning segment as their dating and relationship coach. During our conversation, Claire shares about her own spiritual and sensual awakening after her 19-year marriage ended. She talks about the power of her coaching with soul-aligned entrepreneurs and the transformative magic of her retreats. So as always, I begin by asking my guest, HER is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. When do you feel that Higher Energetic Resonance? Oh, that is the great question. Um, Do you know what immediately came to me was when I truly connect and own my sexuality. And I think that uh, well, I understand why that would be, because um, when a woman owns her voice, she owns her sexuality. And so, yeah, there's like this deep connection, not just uh, um, like anatomy wise, because actually, I don't know if you know, but the, the vulva and the vocal cords is a direct mirror image. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah you knew that and mm-hmm. um I, it's just wild and they were they they came from the same seed until they split into two organs so mm-hmm. for me it's that and when i am truly connected um and i find this like when i'm speaking when i'm coaching you know when i'm writing when i'm fully expressing myself i can feel that whole inner connection and and what I call resonance. Yeah, great question. Love that. Before we go deeper into the conversation, Claire, can you speak about just a bit about your life and what got you to where you are now and the expression of who you are right now? So that's a big question. Um, Mm -hmm. I, yeah, just brief background before I kind of um kind of dive into what's really happened over the past two years because i think that's the most important thing to focus on around this um but i um was married for 19 years with my ex-husband for 21 and in july 2021 i went through the start of a spiritual awakening and i've been sat in my marriage not not happy for a while but just did not have the courage and confidence to step away. The fear was paralyzing, fear of the future, fear of, you know, looking after myself financially, fear of the kids, how they respond, like so much fear. And that caused me to stay. And I think there was also a big part there, which was social conditioning was playing a big role. You know, I'd stepped down that aisle. I'd committed what I thought was my life 
being married. And, you know, there's this whole belief system that we have been conditioned to believe that, you know, like when you get married, like you stay, you know, and that I feel really caused me to stay longer. But but ultimately, you know, I believe everything happens at the right time. Right. And so I feel I was chosen to have this spiritual awakening and how it came about, like the steps that happened before this kind of was created or started were just so aligned, like everything was boom, boom, boom. And it was also to do with leading a retreat, actually. This was my first retreat I'd ever led. And um, I was like, it felt like a divine message, like, and everything just lined up. Like it was sold out in 10 days of me, not even knowing what it was gonna be. Like, it was so clear. And women just stepped in and were like, yep, yeah, I'm coming. I'm like, oh God, oh, holy, holy shit. Like, what am I actually going to be doing on the retreat? But anyway, in on day two of the retreat, it was a three-day retreat, something happened. And I can't really describe it, but something physically, and I'd say energetically, shifted in my body. And that was the start and the catalyst, really, of me fully waking up and so when I stepped back into family life from that weekend that that those days it was like I was a different woman and I was unrecognizable to my ex-husband and I'd say what had happened was I'd fully embodied myself and I was fully being me and you know, something I've really learned along the way is like I was very heavily in my masculine energy, which again came back to conditioning. And then the shift, you know, as I was waking up was really embodying my feminine energy. And obviously we always need both, right? But I was heavily on on the masculine side, um, which was having a massive impact on everything, particularly my marriage, right? So that all became very clear and um, it was literally three weeks after that that I just realised I had to go and it became like a decision that was non-negotiable and I think when your intuition really speaks clearly to you, it comes with that energy of authority Mm -hmm. and so it came with this abundance of courage and suddenly it was like, okay, the words fell out my lap now, so I'm leaving. And I remember my ex was like, have you thought this through, like, you know, how we're going to, like, sort everything out? And like, no. All I knew was the first step, which was the voices. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to really put into words what my life has been like in the last two years since. But um, I have evolved in ways I never thought was possible and still evolving and I've traveled the world. I have just, you know, had just, just really followed my intuition. I was always following my intuition, but this was, this was a different, this has like been in a different way. Like the leaps I've made have been huge. And I think it's because I made that huge leap and left after such a long time, it's allowed me to really then take really big leaps again and again and again, over and over. It's not that the fear isn't present, it is present, but it's like, I'm choosing, do I allow the fear to dictate my choices or am I gonna just really lean into trust here and surrender and go? (laughs) So, um, and I think in all of this is, you know, coming back right to the beginning where we're talking about, you know, owning your voice. Like, I've really done that. Mm. Like, I've really done that. And I feel in a place where um, I've never felt before. And it's and I've been in this place for a while now where I really just feel if there's something I want to express, I express it. It's like all the fear of, like, being like, um, you know, people pleasing, all of that stuff which all comes back to abandonment anyway. Like that's that's the, the deep root of it all. It's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people think of me. I know that I have to 
I know I'm here to make a big impact and I know I need to express this and I don't know who it's for and it might just be for me to express and that's okay. Um, but yeah, it's it feels powerful. You spoke about the transformation that happened to you or the awakening that happened when you were on retreat and as someone who has created retreats and you do one-to-ones and like you know these like specialized different retreat containers I think it would be useful for you to speak about what it is about going on a retreat and being in that kind of space that that actually uh, opens you up is a catalyst for massive shifts because I think sometimes um when um I've never created a whole retreat. I've been part of and facilitated within other people's retreats. And I've also been a participant of retreats. And I know what it is. It kind of gives you a space to like make radical changes that are just not possible in your environment. And for, and I think maybe for people who haven't gone on retreats, sometimes will not be able to really understand what it is that can happen when you're in that space and in that container. Um, because there's only so much um, like, you know, website copy can do. There's only so much that you can you can transmit by putting stuff online or talking about it. Um, and for those who are just looking at, you know, maybe your retreat or someone else's retreat, how can you kind of talk to what it is that happens on a retreat that makes mm. it possible for you to, like you say, come back a completely changed person? And it, and it wasn't just me who was feeling like, you know, I mean, the thing is, you know, when I was stepping into leading my first retreat, I never really thought that actually it would transform me as well. Mm. And that's what I find. Like, and that's one of my core values in my work is like, whoever I coach with, they need to expand me. Like, I want to have, you know, that experience. And, you know, I'm all about evolving myself. And I know the power of that, you know, in everyone's life that I then touch. But yeah, um, it was like huge for me to witness that, oh my gosh, like this was a huge transformation for myself, just leading it. And, you know, the women, you know, on just speaking about this particular retreat, I mean, I've led 11 retreats in two years now. And um, that particular first retreat, I remember most of the women around the table voiced, I feel like I'm going home a new woman. Mm. And I think there's something about the magic um, and the energy in a retreat container. It's like, I notice like the women will step in a little bit anxious, mm. not really knowing all it takes. And I only run, I, I lead either one-to-one -one retreats or very intimate retreats, maximum six women. And um, what I notice is all it takes is one woman to be really vulnerable and then that's it. There's like this ripple effect. And so as the days go on, you know, more is uncovered, more is revealed. And I think, you know, it's an intense situation. And I think, you know, when you've invested at that level, you're there for a reason. And, you know, I always say to the women, this is your retreat, your space. You bring what you want. And they really show up for themselves. Like they really, you know, I can see how much courage it takes for them to voice some of the things that, that they have been, you know, sitting on for years. You know, the shame, the, you know, the suppressed emotions. Um the parts of themselves that maybe they've hidden because they've been judged. You know, it's like creating this very, very safe container for them to be able to be fully witnessed in unconditional love. And it's it's hard to almost put into words like the magic that a retreat can create. But essentially, you know, you've got three days where you really can deep dive. And when I've done one-to-one -one retreats, my last one was in Athens um, this year with a, um, a client. And we had four days together. And she said to me, like, you know, I'm bringing a lot. And I was like, great, bring it, like, bring it. And she, at the end of the retreat, she was like, I don't know how we got through all of that. And, you know, one of the things that I will always do right at the start of a retreat is, like, everyone sets intentions. 
and being really intentional oh my gosh it's incredible how much you can unpack like we unpack everything there is no stone unturned and that's what i really witnessed and i think yeah it's a, there's a real power and i go on lots of retreats myself i'm about to go on one in november actually in, in mexico it's a week long um which will be huge um so yeah i'm a massive advocate of retreats but i think something that um I have seen with one-to-one ones is almost blending some one-to-one coaching around it um, just to keep keep them accountable because, you know, when you step out of that retreat, yes, you feel like a different woman and, you know, you are clear on what your actions are, but all the gremlins still kick off, right? Because that's part of the growth. And so, yeah, this one-to-one retreat that I did recently, um, you know, she had some one-to-one calls um i think it was like two or three after the retreat but just you know to keep her to her word and help her to really make those shifts forwards and you know hold those uncomfortable conversations or whatever it was that was fully aligned and came out of it love it okay and and what do you think it is from your experience that um why we find it so like as women we'll make promises to ourselves say we want to do some stuff and all the rest of it and then manage to kind of just let it go and drop it and make an excuses for the reason what you know like like the you know we've got the new year coming up in a couple of 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 months um and everyone's like yeah i'm gonna this is 2024 is gonna be my you know there's all these big promises about um why this time is going to be the time and that then very quickly it kind of just turns out like the promises you you start lying to yourself or making excuses to yourself and it's like oh well you know um and how 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 people don't or how women don't realize the impact of letting yourself down repeatedly like that you know like constantly going oh well it doesn't matter well this happened and and allowing other things to come in like how do you um kind of strengthen your car- your your clients to be like listen if you're going to make these promises to yourself keep these promises to yourself what what do how do you walk them through that yeah, and I think, you know, as human beings, we'll, we'll avoid, avoid, avoid discomfort. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't, we don't want to, we think we don't want to feel pain. But the thing is, like, life is, a, is polarity. Everything is about polarity. And the law of polarity is like, you know, everything in the universe has an opposite and it exists at the same time. So if you want immense pleasure, well you get to feel immense pain as well. And I think, um, so when you're not working with a coach, and I know this from when years ago, when I wasn't ever working with a coach, I was just coasting, you know, Mm. coasting. I wasn't ever feeling the big highs and the big lows. I was just like coasting, you know, because, um, you know, we've been wired to not be sad, be happy all the time that's not living life that is not living and experiencing a full human experience and you know how i coach my clients is i hold them in that discomfort Mm -hmm. and you know whatever their aligned action is off the back of a coaching call you know i ask them they need to check in with me let me know how that goes And if they haven't checked in with me, then when we have our next call, I'm like, how did that go? And yeah, essentially, you know, as human beings, we avoid it. And that's why accountability is huge. Um, And when we, you know, particularly, I don't know, uncomfortable conversations is coming to mind as an example. And on this trip, I've just come back from a trip in India and it was a really intense experience, right? I was with 16 people, only one person that I knew a little bit. I didn't know the rest. There were some big personalities and stuff came up and I had to have some really uncomfortable conversations. And 
I'm a master at that now. Like I'll own that because I've had so many. I've had to have so many. And we only start to, you know, like really become mastered at something by practice. And it's a bit like, you know, doing a podcast interview. It's like, you know, we jumped on here today. We didn't know what we were going to talk about. But it's almost like, you know, being willing to be uncomfortable. And um, I think, you know, as humans, we try to avoid that as much as possible, essentially. So for me, it's like really holding my clients accountable. And, you know, they get to choose, of course they always get to choose. Um, I will shine a light on things and show them, you know, what is out of alignment um, through coaching together. But they ultimately get to choose whether they take that action and make that choice. And it's interesting. I um, I was offering some one-to-one calls, like one-off, and they're really powerful just having one one-off call with me. And it's interesting, there's um, a client that I was coaching and he had all of his aligned actions lined up, hasn't done any, mm-hmm. checked in with him. And, you know, well, I asked him to check in with me and um, he didn't, so I checked in with him. How is that going? None of it's, nothing, none of it's changed. And... And that's okay. There's no judgment for that, but he's not happy. So, you know, I think we, we've we been wired to, you know, everyone get on with each other. You know, don't, don't, don't confront things. Don't ruffle, ruffle people's feathers. We avoid these uncomfortable conversations. And then that really doesn't serve us because we're sat in a place of, I'm really pissed off about this. And it impacts relationship it impacts business it impacts your sex life it impacts everything Mm. and you know i coach very much the whole person because all of it is deeply interconnected who we're being in the bedrooms who we're being in in our business like it's all interrelated so yeah so that's where i say that's really how i would navigate that with a client yeah yeah good um and uh, there was something that you put on um i think it was recently anyway because I, I just love your social media because you just come on and i'm like yeah <laughs> like we, we need to see more of that but you mentioned um sister wound mm. no and and um i want you to interpret it in your way because maybe i you know maybe i could have read it a different way but i kind of thought of it like we we speak a a lot about the father wound the mother wound but then there's the sister wound the the kind of the damage that we do to each other and how how are you uh speaking about this and how are you trying to make a shift around that yeah and this really is like this comes back to you know generational patterns um i want to say curses you know like and i think you know we have we've we've all grown up in this very masculine energy the conditioned masculine i like to call it Mm -hmm. and what that has done is really disempowered women and it's taught women to pull other women down like that's what we're taught Mm -hmm. um it's no one's fault like it's just run through generations and i feel like part of my legacy is to really um inspire motivate and model how to be free and the thing is like when women unite like we are powerful and that's why like the you know society knows that society knows that when women unite like they're powerful because um, the feminine energy is way more powerful, really powerful. But here's the thing, it pushes up against the conditioned masculine, which is all about control and stability. And, you know, like society rewards control. Like if you um, have a mortgage, you get a credit card, right? All of that stuff. And I think, 
you know, the the feminine energy is much more like, you know, a woman who's really embodied in her feminine, like she is untamable. Like she works with her intuition, you know, she is um what's the other word I want to use around this? It's almost like she's boundaryless, right? There are no there are no boundaries. And of course that rubs right up against everything we've been taught in society in this conditioned masculine. And so it really ruffles feathers. And something that I have really witnessed, and yeah, I, I had to speak about this, Sister Wounds, because it's like women who are being and it's not their fault. Like, I I was one of those women too, right? Until I woke up to this. And it's just through our conditioning that we are behaving and we were behaving in that way. And it's like, what I'm seeing is like, the more I ooze this confidence, this courage, this, this sense of freedom and like really in tune with myself and, you know, showing up in a way where it's like, I give zero fuck, you know, and really expressing fully. It's like um, this response of like a passive aggressiveness mm. that comes. And it's because the women, um, I'd say, you know, they don't know any different. Like they are just living within, you know, what they've been conformed to believe. And so you know, when they're witnessing women like me or any other women who are fully in their power, like, they're confused and just like, you know, what is this energy? Like, and it's very triggering for them. And it's like, um, and I see it so clearly, so clearly. And I think what I used to do, I would have shrunk. Mm. I would have shrunk myself to try and, oh, not ruffle the feathers. And now I'm like, mm -mm, nope. Because this is the healing that we need. And this is like the impact I know I'm here to make. And to really, I don't like this expression, but it's the only words that are coming to me right now. But almost like call it out. Mm. Like really call it out and go, look, this is what I'm seeing. Like, and if we could all just unite, like we lift each other higher. Yeah. And, but yeah, essentially, you know, just, just rubbing up right again everything we've been led to believe. Mm, mm. And and I like that you said call it out, you know, because mm. it's um and, and as you were speaking, like a couple of words that came came up for me to like um was the the scarcity idea, the idea that if there's one sister up there, then she sucks up the air, she's got all the attention, and then we're all just in in the shadows of her, so that then like in, like one woman shines and then everyone's like, okay, there's no room for us. How can how can we fit? Because like you say, it's all about this idea that there's you know, there's there's like a, a pinnacle for it. There's like a, a pyramid, like the 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 structure of, of masculine business is like, you know, CEO or the head honcho, and then everyone is like a subordinate to that. Um, whereas when you get into collaboration, it's abundant because they're, they're like, we just kind of feed off each other and it just kind of spreads. And there's like, no, there's no, there are no edges to it. Like there's, there's no edges to the way that we feel. And then there's no edges to like how big or wide we can we can be. You know, we pour into each other, and it's like, oh, okay. And then you you rise, and then oh, I'm, I'm rising at the same time as well. If you allow yourself to see that, and I know mm -hmm. when I'm around women who get it, that's that what that's what's that what that is what goes on. You know, we like kind of like we we feed each other, we kind of play with each other, we we give and and we we move around when I'm with or, or when I encounter women who don't get it yet or who for whatever reason are just not used to being around good people, you know, for mm. that they're, you know, it may be like a, a, a string of bad relationships or, or, or things where they've just not allowed themselves, they've not been seen so that then when someone sees them and actually meets them with kindness and gentleness and like genuine kindness and gentleness, you know, backed up by, <laughs> but no bullshit, you know, because that's, mm -hmm. that's where it comes from. So it's genuine kindness and gentleness. 
they're they're suspicious of the whole thing and they're just literally waiting for the other stiletto to drop basically it's like yeah she's being nice but what does she want when's it all gonna go when's it all gonna go off it's like yeah but you know there's there's this mistrust that there could possibly be an open-hearted woman that wants the best for you without trying to like do you over or steal your man or or you you know whatever it is or trying to like kind of cut you down or or discredit you or speak about you behind your back and um yeah the, there's that I'm seeing that that's where the new shift needs to kind of happen in that allow it, it is there are women out that there are women out there there are women out here who want that but also like you say we but we in order for us to have that we need to call out where we've been before we need to point the finger at someone when they're playing a game with us and go like, do you know what? I don't do that. I'm trying to be nice with you. And if you're not able to handle nice and kind, sorry that your life experience has brought you to this place of mistrust, mm. but you know, hard conversations, you know, instead of just yeah. going, Oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter. And maybe she's been through some stuff. It's like, yeah, maybe she's been through some stuff, but if she blindly keeps going on with like, she's been through some stuff and everyone's, tiptoeing around her we're not empowering her either we're holding mm. ourselves back by not feeding into into her didn't yeah because of victim energy and it's just validating the victim which you mm. know is disempowering but um yeah i love what you said about like really pouring into each other and yeah there is like this, this bit of, like what does she want <laughs> what does she want it's like she's just sharing like her energy and her presence with you and wants to lift you up as well i have a match tattoo on my leg and for me that really is like the embodiment of the work i feel i do which is like i'm a lit match and i just light everyone else's match mm. because yeah like there's enough for everyone there's enough fire for everyone there's enough space for everyone we are all unique we all have different gifts and superpowers and yeah, like it's so potent when we can just unite and fly together. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we've been taught like there's this, you know, like hierarchy and, you know, the better than, um, you know, making women compete against each other. And it's like, oh my. Yeah, it has to stop. Yeah, yeah. And I know I won't stop talking about that. <laughs> yeah like good because because me either and and um yeah because it was a it was a shift for myself as well you know to be especially coming from a place where I'd spent so much time just like oh they don't like that part of me then I just won't be that so you shrink and 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 then when I started to meet open-hearted women when I started to go to retreats where I could just kind of lay it all out and then find different corners refine different corners of me again and like allow those little glimpses of myself that I had seen that I've just kind of pushed away because I wasn't in the space where it was where it where it could be held really you know if i'm not in the right company there are um there'd be people that just wouldn't be able to see me or i'd be saying something and they literally just couldn't hear what i was saying almost like i might as well have not been opening my mouth you know because they're just either misinterpreting it taking it as a personal slur or just or, or just have not had those kind of conversations. So for me, when I started to be around open-hearted sisters in the spiritual community, it was like, you know, it it took a while having come from that that place of like the constant criticism, always pulling at the things that are making you um making you 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 know it was like you're so tall you're, you know like I'd, I'd like my especially when my physical appearance would be torn down you know as a joke as well like there's not really much that you can do about your physical appearance unless you sabotage it which is some of the things that I would do is literally sabotage my own appearance so that I didn't trigger other women because of the way that I looked and mm -hmm. and, it, and it took a while for me to really um recognize what i was doing to myself like why am i self-harming because they can't handle it and then when i started to go into places where they're like oh my god like you, you know and celebrate it they're like I, it took a while because i'm like are they joking are they like playing a game with me like why this is coming from a woman's mouth and she's she wants better for me like it, it and it was unfortunate that that was unusual 
but then it but then as well as I started to grow within that and feel that that was supported and if not encouraged or even like pushed it's like what are you doing why are you why are you playing small why can't you see what it is that you're bringing no like we Mm. need you and like you are doing these other things and and then you start to kind of blossom and grow in this and then realize that there are women that want that and the ones that don't yet haven't yet found that part of themselves or don't find that deservedness to be able to take up space or don't realize that they've you know screwed themselves up into a tiny ball in a tiny corner in their own lives which is why then they get so triggered by um someone else's light and and will defend their own limitations because again when i hear people kind of go well you know that's just the way i am and you know it's like well no that's the way that you're choosing to be and you can be so Mm -hmm. much more um and how hard that is for some women to to own you know yeah completely i was just smiling away i just love that you have found your people and that you can be all of you um because yeah i think as you you know as we go through this evolution and really wake up to who we are and and show up as all of ourselves you know um because like you've got a big energy i've got a big energy i know that i see it when i walk in a room like i can see exactly what is present and um how people are responding to me and it's so it's so wonderful when you can just like just continue to just be who mm. you are and not like do what we used to do which was like oh let's say oh i better not show that part of myself i better not flirt and like <laughs> yeah. you know all that thing it's like so part of who I am. like oh, i can't push that away like mm. um so i just yeah that's just beautiful to hear and yeah and it's really interesting I noticed like how my circle change because they have to because I think you know when you are on this huge spiritual journey like we are like people become out of alignment very quickly mm. and it's interesting like I had a couple of voice notes this morning from two people who are very new in my life um about my experience in india just going how are you and i was like so touched i was like in tears so i was like wow they really get the enormity of what i've just done Mm -hmm. and it's you know you can be friends with other people you know for people for years but they may not just get some of the stuff that we are creating and some of the fear that we're overcoming Mm -hmm. and so i think it's you know i'm never looking for external validation but it's beautiful to receive that reflection and go yeah actually that was really huge Mm -hmm. and acknowledge yourself for it and that in itself is is such a powerful question when someone asks like a simple question like that how are you doing are you all right you know not to kind of pull you down just to make sure that the core of you is good and that is probably like the most powerful question that any of us can ask each other it's just like are you are you good sis you know like get right to to that whisper just to your heart to like remind you that you're still you in the midst of it even when you're out there taking up big space being big energy there is that that part of you that just needs a little bit of a nurture and a and just an eye to eye contact or, or you say like a little voice note that will just be like yeah okay am i you know like or maybe you ask the question like am i am i good is it okay and then so you can just like remember to just reflect and check in on yourself that moment before you go mm. out and do the big things and walk in the big energy to make sure that the core of you is completely good yeah i agree and i think um yeah it's not like she was worried about me it's just like Mm. i'm checking in like i'm checking in and i think um you know she's a woman and um you know she's up to big stuff as well and yeah she was like you know i haven't checked in before because i thought you probably needed space and i thought wow like what incredible awareness Mm. and yeah so much gratitude for you know, having these incredible women around me um, 
that really can understand, like, because we are creating big stuff in the world. And, you know, that brings up all the things and all the feelings. And part of being powerful is allowing yourself to feel everything. And, you know, when you've cracked yourself open in a, in a, a way that is like, I <laughs> can't describe, you know, yes, you feel immense pleasure, um, but my gosh, like you feel the the darkness, mm. the, you know, the grief on another level and mm. the sadness and all of those things. So, you know, and it's like we have to, it's so important to, to be able to play all those keys on the piano, I like to say it, which is um, uh, a Rene, um, is it Rene? Oh, the Regina, Regina oh. Thomas Hower in her book, Pussy, she talks about how women, you know, should play every single key on the piano, all 76, I think it's 76, um, because we have all these emotions that we need to express. Mm. And allowing ourselves to express all of those allows us to really be the powerful kind of energy that we are. Mm -hmm. Talking of pussy... Let's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> That's a smooth segue into into just like the the um, revolution and the expression and the sexual expression that really needs to happen with women. Also, you know, of um, without it being this <laughs> what the media's played as sex, which is just like some weird, warped little boys' fantasy. Of, of like that has very little to do with womanhood whereas womanhood is and that sensuality and that sexuality and that expression of that is so powerful so gushing so juicy like all the terms you know mm. how do you speak to that and how how do you embody what's happened in your life in that area yeah so um I've been on a huge journey with this and um I stepped into the dating world in December 21. So nearly two years now dating. I've written a whole book on it. And I have a, a, a radio show where I talk about my dating experiences, everything that I've learned. And um, I've been dating guys. And every single guy has taught me something about myself. But I think... Um, one thing that that happens when you go through a spiritual awakening is you awaken yourself sexually so i come from you know never really being turned on suddenly 24 7 i'm like what what's what's this feeling <laughs> this is nice okay um but sexual energy is like powerful in business and mm. um <laughs> essentially what that did is it it one, it really cracked me open to mm. feel on such a deep cellular level, but also get really deeply intimate with myself. And I think, you know, sex is so portrayed about it having to be with another person. Mm. And, you know, and I think this all comes back to conditioning as well. Um, because I think, you know, I know I was carrying so much shame around sex, self-pleasuring, you know, all of it's done behind behind closed doors. It's taboo. Um, no chat about self pleasure, like no chat. You know, and I think there's, you know, there's the words that come up that I used to almost, um, and this would have really been through condition. Is like it's almost like dirty, you know, mm. all of that. And I think you know that I there was masses of shame, and so I really didn't know my body. Um, for most of my life and yeah going through this awakening like really got me to get really deeply intimate with my body and I think then stepping into dating what that's allowed me to do is like one really fully express what I want um, but also really learn what I love and what turns me on and you know just get just get really adventurous and explore um, in a way that I've never explored before. And, you know, sexuality and, you know, um, spirituality are deeply interconnected, of course. 
Mm. Um, but I think, oh yeah, just going back to the self pleasure. One thing I wanted to mention on that, I remember I was working with a sex coach last year, and one of the things he shared with me was um, in the industrial revolution, they actually labelled um, self pleasuring as manual stupidity. <laughs> right to do with the men right oh so they were basically said that because they wanted the birth rate to go up but they didn't want men having fun with themselves which comes back to the thing about scarcity right because society breeds and slaps scarcity on us right mm -hmm. and it's like it's almost like going okay right so if you if you have an orgasm that sperm is wasted and there isn't going to be enough like almost like you know there isn't an abundance and of course there's an abundance of everything there's an abundance of, of sperm there's an abundance of money like you know like there's an abundance and mm -hmm. we've been taught that there's a limit and that we're limited and it's like even in sexuality like that was a thing i mean so you imagine like you know there's that was about men imagine what that was about women and you know something that i've really uncovered is like how interesting like how women were never really allowed to fully express themselves mm -hmm. because here's the thing in 1975 it was the first opportunity for a woman to have her own bank account as a single mm -hmm. woman right wow. so she had to be with a man to be financially secure, right? So of course, she wouldn't fully express herself sexually for fear that she might lose, you know, her financial stability. Um, so there's just like such, you know, when you start to really uncover some of this conditioning and this generational pattern, you know, uh, or patterns, it's like, you're like, wow, I can see why women have been so repressed sexually because yeah there was this fear of losing everything so you imagine you know a woman wouldn't be flirtatious a wouldn't or you know like god forbid she might fall in love with someone because yeah i don't you know when you're married you don't intentionally think oh i'm gonna go off and see if i can fall in love with someone mm -hmm. but it happens right we fall in love as human beings like it happens and so yeah, you imagine she would not even, you know, wouldn't allow herself to even explore that or even voice a desire around wanting to be with another man or wanting to be with another woman. Like, and, you know, that has like run through conditioning. And I think, you know, there's definitely, it's opening up more, but we've got a long way to go, a long way to go. Um, so I talk a lot about, conscious sexuality and sex positive and um, really owning that. And I love it when my clients voice note me, telling me that they bought their new sex toys or they've, you know, just had an experience with um, a date or a, their husband in the shower or whatever it is. And like really like owning their sexuality and really making those choices from a place of empowerment mm -hmm. and also the fact that um sexuality and sensuality needs to be seen as something that continues until the day that you die as opposed to yeah. something that like just oh, kind yeah. of gets the, the rug that gets pulled away from you when you hit i don't know you know so so even to the point where they're like like the the you you think of or the, the conditioning has been the idea that anyone over the age of 60 or 70 still does it is like, ooh, disgusting. It's like, why? Why would it be? Like, why can't they just keep going until until the heart gives out? <laughs> like, why, why do we kind of like, like limit it to just be like a young kid's thing when a lot of the time at that point in time, you don't fully know who you are and what you want and you're still holding back so much. And then when you get to the point where you're you're able to express and own yourself fearlessly, then, you know, sex was something that you used to do. <laughs> yeah, we're supposed to be in pleasure. Mm. Like, our bodies are supposed to be in pleasure. You're like, why, 
I don't know why there would be, but yeah, it's true. Like there's this end date. Why would there be an end date for anything? In fact, you know, like mm. even like um, retirement. When people talk about retirement, they go, oh, "I think I'm going to retire in five years," and I'm thinking, "I don't think you know that." Like, because it's all about how you feel. Like I don't see any end date with what I do. It's mm. such a part of who I am. Like I'm like no, like. I've got so much more to, to give and I've got a yeah, huge mission that I'm completing in this lifetime. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? How there's this ageism, you know, and again, it's societal conditioning. Mm-hmm. There's, yeah, I, I, and especially the thing about retirement, I can't, <laughs> like, it's, it's, I'm like, I've only just started this thing. Like, why am I, why am I going to retire it? You know, it's, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre situation. Talking about retirement, when I, um, when I went to Bali and I came back to the UK, um, I, I like needed to like, like build my funds up like super quick. And one of the things that I was doing, um, I was working in this, um, I was working in this office. It was like terrible, terrible thing to come from Bali and then to be in an office. It was mind numbingly like talk about feeling every single minute it was painful yeah and I was just trying to do like a little part-time thing and I I I bet I had to walk out in the end I'm like I can't I I literally can't do this because five minutes would just feel like forever um wow and it's you know you really notice how 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 slow time can go if you're doing something that is just against you, it's like, this is why people age because they're doing things that are just not part of their soul. And like that, you know, I'd be like, okay, let, let me just go to the loo. Like I go to the loo and come back and only one minute had gone past. I'm like, how is this even possible? Whereas like when I'm here and working on my own, like, like 10 hours ago and I'm like I've still not finished all the things you know like I'm getting up early trying to do things I'm fitting it in between stuff and time is different which is why then I suppose I kind of express differently I look differently because I'm in a different space I'm not experiencing mm. time in the same way but one thing that I remember was I'm working with people who've been in this job for years and there there was one guy there and he um there was a, a postman that used to come in every afternoon to kind of get the mail and all this kind of stuff. And they always used to have this um, converse, conversation of, they were just like complaining about their lives. It was like, oh, how are you doing? Oh, you know, mess and grumble. You know, like you're listening to this kind of conversation and how are you? Oh, well, you know how it is. And the, there was one thing that he said, and this was like the nail for me going like, we're leaving. We're like, we're not staying around these people where he's like, well, you know, I've only got 12 more years till retirement. Wow. It was the most frightening thing I'd ever heard. I'm like, we're out. We we can't stay here. That idea that like you will stay in a situation that is giving you absolutely nothing, not feeding you, not making you... Um, grow in any way you really just you kind of dislike everyone around you you don't like the boss you don't like your co-workers you don't really like the job you you live for the two weeks of holiday that you have every year and then you're just well you know 12 years 11 years 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 oh good I'm, I'm out now and usually then you find that people that do retire are saving everything up for that retirement and then when you retire you don't know what to do with yourself you've got no structure because you've you've never lived in joy and even you're just used to doing something that you just do because you do it as opposed to the idea of doing something from your heart and making that work for you it was just a stark contrast to come from you know being in Bali for five months and waking up as and when I did and doing bits and pieces and then just being like someone's going you're counting the next 12 years sir I'll never forget it because it was it filled me with dread just to hear that and I just never heard anyone talk about their life in that way no but I think that is so common you know people yeah. live in fear mm. like so they think oh well I better stay here you know this is a s- secure job right but energetically it's draining the life out of them so of course yeah when they finish yeah they they're, they're flawed 
they're flawed because they haven't done, like you say, the things that, that really light them up, the joy. And that's why, you know, we have so much energy because we're in this creative flow. We've created something that really taps into that creative energy, which all, by the way, comes from the womb. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the source of creation. And we're totally tapped into that. So we're fully um, inspired. But there's a great quote by, um, do you know Miles Monroe? No. Oh, my God. This is my favorite, one of my favorite quotes. He said, don't die old, die empty. Hmm. I'm all for that. Yeah. Die empty. And he, one of his, like, his, like, sort of colleague or partner, Les Brown, he always says, like, the richest place in the world is the graveyard because it's where everyone takes their unfulfilled dreams and goals. Mm. And it's like, are you, you were given that dream because you were to, meant to create it. And I think people live in so much fear of letting go of what they think is stability when mm. there actually is no stability because you could get made redundant tomorrow. Mm. But the fear is so consuming to take that leap And that's why, you know, as coaches, like we have such a big role to play to really help people to really step into their true soul calling Mm. so that they get to live this abundant, creative fueled lifestyle that we get to experience. By the way, I think they've been in in Bali. You know, Mm. that's one of my soul homes. We haven't chatted about. Yeah, we haven't. Bali is like, I'd live there in a heartbeat. I really? love Bali. It was an interesting time for me. So I went to, I did India 2017, February, and then I came back to London and I, I was just really out of sorts because, you know, I spoke to you before just to say like watching your reels and everything. I'm like, yeah, I remember that chaos and that, you know, the noise and everything about it. And I just loved it. It was so different. And it, and it triggered a lot of people, me going as well, because I remember prior to going, I had to go to a family event. It was a funeral. So I'm sitting around on, on a table with um, like family and kind of family's friends and all this kind of thing. And when, when people found out that I was going, they're like, what are you doing? going to India like black women don't go to India kind of telling me all the reasons why it was a bad idea and I was like well have you been already it was like what are you doing there why are you going there aren't you scared I'm like well no because actually on this trip I'm I'm I don't really have the most difficult part of the trip is the fact that I'm just gonna have to sit in Delhi airport for five hours (laughs) waiting for my connection that was the hard bit like any other part of it wasn't wasn't difficult at all and I met you know there's a guy that I met that I'm still we're still not reconnected but we keep seeing each other online every now and again and he was the first person who spoke to me because when I flew from London I went to Abu Dhabi or somewhere in Saudi so it's all met no one was speaking to me of course because like I'm the only woman there so they're not speaking to me and then out to India as well and it wasn't till we we took like the small plane that was taking me from Delhi he came on he was like this like six foot tall Indian guy that is now you know like kind of like a guru over there as well like really special guy and he came on in like this big smile and that was my introduction to mm-hmm. India like because I was like half asleep you know for all of those hours going there anyway every now and again he'll like pop up on a whatsapp call and we'll have like a chat usually at the like the wrong time for me but you know it's like I've got to have a chat with him to see where he is and that just really opens so much for me that when I came back to London I was like yeah like where are the cows you know like in the the cows yeah (laughs) it was like a real kind of like oh right okay and I and I at that time I was just like there is no better place than London you know um but then it was like something never settled with me I kind of stuck with it for you know got back on the wheel a little bit but like working outside of the wheel in the way that I always did by the next uh winter September 2018 and October 2018 I'm like I, I can't do winter here. I've got to go. So I like, like stuffed all my stuff in in storage and just went. I'm like, I'm going to stay for as long as I can. I was there for, yeah, five months or something like that. I just needed that. I made some amazing friends that I'm still friends with now. 
I met a friend that I'd met in India and she was that in Bali at the same time. It was things that um, travel and just going into somewhere where you're just like a stranger in a strange land. I love that, you know, and I know Me that some, I know that some people get really triggered by it because I, I remember someone saying to me one time, um, when I was saying, they were saying, what do you want to do? You know, like, Carol, you look really lost. What do you want to do? I'm like, I want to travel. And they were like, but it's such a big world, Carol. I'm like, exactly. That's exactly the reason why I need to go. I'm not going to just stay here for the rest of my life, you know. So that was in, in itself really transformative, you know, and then coming back and trying to re group and it made it like you know when you talk about coming back and having lots of different shifts it made me see certain things differently and I had to make some really big choices as a result of that that long-term travel being in a place where I barely speak the language where I don't look like anybody that fills me because I think what the people who were trying to like go what do you want to go to India for it's dangerous they hate us all this thing it's like no like when I travel yeah, it's different. And I love the difference, but I always like honing on what's familiar, you know, because it's like, okay, mm. I need to know where I'm going to wash my clothes. I, you know, I need to find the normal things and I look mm. for similarities as well as find the differences. And it's, I always encourage anyone to, to just like go somewhere, go some, somewhere different, go on your own if you can. You know, if you've got the guts to do it, that will like really bring out something in you that you'll you'll never really experience if you go with someone that you know, because you'll kind of like cling on to each other a little bit and you won't necessarily look outside and see where you are and how you are in relation to a completely different environment. Yeah, mm. I love just travel in general fills me up. Oh, me too. Oh, my gosh. I didn't know we had that same passion because, yeah, yeah travel is my thing. Mm. totally my thing and I love solo traveling I actually I actually like going on my own always and um I've done two trips to Bali in the last nine months actually solo and oh my gosh like it's just amazing but I've done loads of other trips solo as well mm. um and when I go out to Mexico next month um I'll be going alone and yeah I'm going on a retreat but then around that I'll be on my own um which yeah is exciting it's incredibly empowering experience because you have to become very resourceful mm -hmm. because experiences happen stuff happens and you have to navigate all sorts of experiences and you're doing it alone and particularly mm -hmm. when you're in another time zone like it's not like you can phone anyone phone a friend <laughs> and, you know like no one's awake no one's awake like yeah. you're doing this alone and Oh my God, I had all sorts of experiences in Bali that I had to navigate. And mm. um, yeah, like it's really powerful to do that, I think. Um, yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. Just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out where the next one's going to be. Yes. I don't know where to go. I it's... want to know. I want yeah, to know. I don't... Where would you love to go next? What comes up? Do you know what? Like recently I've been doing like some teaching and teaching students in like Japan and China and really getting to know them on a personal level. You know, because obviously my idea of China is just built by what the media tells me and like the the Western idea of China. And of course, like elements of, of, of that may be true, may be true. But then when you get to know um, individuals who live in a completely different environment to you and get to know their personalities and how they see the world and what they tell and what they tell you about their everyday experience. Um, that's always what I want when I travel. I don't want to go and stay in a, in a resort. That's just, that's not traveling. You know, you might, you might as well just stay in your house and watch a YouTube video. Maybe there, but mm. China's massive, you know? So if I was going to go- Oh my God, <laughs> you need a long you know, time. It would, it would take so much and it wouldn't just be about going to the cities. It would be going out into the country and the provinces and really seeing what that is about, the emphasis that they put on education and also the fact that they will then take themselves out of their comfort zone and 
struggle to learn a completely different language like English, you know, that isn't even in their mouth because their language doesn't require them to use certain syllables. There are certain mouth movements or or letters they can't say properly because these have just been dormant for them. So even just like literally having to shift the way that you use your body physically in order to then be able to communicate and like the highest amount of respect, you know, and I think in the UK we, we kind of don't respect the fact of how hard it is for people, especially outside of Europe, to learn the English language and to understand and to want to kind of transfer themselves into a different culture. We kind of take it for granted. And we've been told that, you know, English is, you know, obviously English is one of the um, most spoken languages, but then anyone who doesn't speak that is is less than. No, people who have been... I have so much respect when people speak our language yeah and and Um, and also understand the nuance of english as well like the humor and the the tone and everything like that is like completely different some of my students are people who've been in industry for years 20 30 years and are taking it on to like shift their careers or be able to kind of be more global you know so it's it it really just opens up a new level of respect for people and I learned you know you talk about learning so much from people when you coach them get when I'm teaching them I'm learning so much you know like whether it's somebody who's 50 years old or whether it's like a young girl who's just like 15 16 and like sometimes I'm like you need to take some time off and have some fun because you're 15 but then the the thinking there is like education 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 to the point where they're not expanding so I always come in like the fun auntie it's like yeah we're gonna learn but we're gonna Good. learn fun, <laughs> in a fun way you know so I like that I am yeah. um, I'm a homeschool mum so I'm you know really yeah I have a lot to say about education we won't get into that now <laughs> exactly. but, but yeah I you know like if you're you're happy doing something and it's fun you're gonna learn more Exactly. exactly. Um, so yeah, it's so deeply important in everything we do. But mm. yeah, I always um, like when people speak to me, and I think about this, like being in Bali, like people would struggle to say my name. So like mm. what you're saying about, you know, how it actually is not in their language, like there, um, they would really like, they would have to say it over and over. And I always would be like, just going, you've got great English, like, Thank you, because, yeah, we're so lazy, I think, as mm. a nation, because we expect everyone to speak English. And actually, you know, when I was in India recently, no one spoke English when I needed someone to tell me where to go. And we can still communicate despite not having the same language. And um, I used to have a lot of fun in Bali with the driver that I used to use a lot for like my airport runs, because he would want to know all of the fun kind of, you know, jokey stuff in English. So I was just teaching loads of different things. We'd have a right giggle. Today's been great. Thank you for the conversation that we've had. Any parting words? And and then also just share where everyone can find you, Claire. You know, like share if there's something new coming up for you as well. Um, I think my parting word for everyone listening is I talk a lot about trusting yourself and like really embodying an unshakable trust. And that's really, you know, allowing yourself to to listen to your body and being in your body and listening to your intuition. You know, there's a lot of fear around that for people, which I really understand, I really get. Like, just play with it in a really small way and take, you know, those small actions because it's like a muscle, you know. The more we take action on the small little intuitive hits, then the bigger ones start to come. Like, the universe will give us those. Because the universe ultimately rewards the courageous one. And when we can take steps that are really true to us and, like, coming from our soul, like, yeah, we can create huge waves when we just keep taking those small steps forward. So that's my kind of passing wisdom, really. And then in terms of, like, how people can connect with me, um, I have a website, which is clairedore.com, which is spelled with a D-O-R-E. And... I am also very active on Facebook under Claire Dore. Um, TikTok and Instagram is the World Woman CEO. 
Um, and that's really like social media is where my up to date kind of content is because I'm just constantly evolving and expressing. So um, those are great ways to connect with me. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much for today. Oh, I've loved it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Claire, for sharing and thank you for listening. Once again, I want to remind you that your awakened voice is now available to you if you're ready to express yourself freely without the fear of judgment and embrace the unique beauty of your voice. There are links also to the Higher Energetic Resonance Inspirations podcast and mailing list. And also, if you're ready to step into that higher version of yourself and you're ready to work with me on a one-to-one basis on my personalized higher energetic resonance spiritual life coaching program, follow the link in the show notes to find out more information and book a call with me and let's get you started so that you're ready to step into next year in that higher energetic resonance state if you want to find out more about me and more about all the other things that i'm doing do go to my website it's carolmaywittick.com c-a-r-o-l-m-a-e-w-h-i-t-t-i-c-k.com carol may Wittig on facebook and on linkedin and kazmic c-a-z-m-i-c-k on instagram once again thanks for joining have a great week speak to you next one take care